Right, well, we'll see how we do. Um, tomorrow's standards together. Um, one of the things that's already been mentioned is the shed strategy, and you've all got a card on your seats. Do go and have a look at the website. Pulling together. Um, and really, the shed strategy has been given great impetus recently through the launch of Our Place and Time, the Scottish Historic Environment Strategy for Scotland, and which is the first time that that um, type of strategy has been pulled together. And this has been very much a kind of collaborative um, production of this particular strategy. And I've just pulled out a couple of sort of key points and that are coming out, the place that the strike environment is playing, um, and also how we're looking at delivering the strategy, which is very much in collaboration. Um, and in fact, the Cabinet Secretary talks about a Team Scotland approach to delivering this strategy, but that's really what there is within Scotland at the moment. Um, I think SHED has been in production for some sort of two, almost three years um, to get to that. But the historic environment strategy has sort of bubbled up for a variety of um, circumstances um, and I think is very much a collaborative strategy that everyone has been working on, developing and pulling together. It is a shared vision. And this mirrors a number of other strategies, the museums and galleries strategy and also the Creative Scotland strategy, um, which has just been launched. But another factor that's coming through um, is also the longevity of these strategies. Each of these are looking at least at a 10-year period, so also recognizing that there is time required to deliver these. And I just wanted to highlight the different elements um, that are coming out within the strategy um, and the key themes that we're going to be aiming to tackle. Investigating and recording, caring and protecting, and valuing for sharing and celebrating. And these are all elements where different partners within the sector will take on board elements to deliver. But key to all of this is data and knowledge and information. Um, and this is really where SHED starts coming into its own. So a key element um, within all of this is um, that we have a proper understanding of the value of the historic environment. And there's a real desire to have the right information in order to insist decision making, but also to create information that people can, can value, they can understand their local environment, and also then do the celebrating um, part within that. But in order to have that, we need the data to underpin it, and that's where SHED will be coming in. But part of what's also happened is the whole mainstreaming of historic environment. Um, and this lovely slide, which is beginning to fade a bit there, but again shows how historic environment has been placed within the heart of the kind of policy making within Scottish government and is seen as being a factor within everything from international policy to the built environment and those um, and kind of rural and economic development as well. So those discussions are also starting. So what we're also seeing is a driver for collaborations into sectors that we don't normally engage with. And this is all underpinned, interestingly enough, by the governance um, strategy that's been developed by Scottish Government. And I just thought I'd flash this up, but actually just again showing how it's been embodied and how that collaboration has been taken out from an overarching board chaired by the Cabinet Secretary to kind of operational boards and working groups that are taking in whole elements of the sector to feed into this in order to make it happen. So as I said, knowledge and data underpins all of this. And um, as various of you have mentioned, Scottish, the historic environment data strategy has been something we've been working on for a period of time in order to bring all of this together. So how are we going to deliver it? Well, it's taken us a wee while to get to actually having the strategy. But everyone has worked on it together. And it has very much been something that's been co-produced by the SMIHERs the Commission, Historic Scotland, and various other national trusts as well as sort of fed into the process. So various different players within the historic environment sector to deliver this strategy, recognizing that we need better data in order to have that informed decision making. And at the moment, we're using PastMap as the portal through which people can access this shared data. Um, and we're recognizing that there are a number of things we need to work on within the shared strategy. So our aim is very much to improve the data that we already have and this is what some more detailed data looks like on past map, and to start working through some of our different aims. We want to develop standards um, and make sure that there is consistency across the data that we have. We want to improve the content and increase users of this particular data. 
We want to improve efficiency um, in data creation, but also in keeping the data updated. And we also want to reduce duplication. And we've had lots of discussions around about duplication and have come to a point where we recognize that some duplication is required in order to allow us to link the different data sets and to make more and better information available. And we're then looking to promote this. And the Scottish Historic Environment Data Strategy now has a wider board looking at how we implement that. And we're beginning to have some very interesting discussions with colleagues um, on both sort of the archives and museums side. And again, when you look at the Historic Environment Strategy, not only is the Historic Environment Strategy sector mentioned, but museums and archives feature prominently in that. And that's led to some interesting discussions with colleagues within the archive sector suddenly going, right, places. We need spatial data. What are we going to do about that? And so we're beginning to engage with them and looking at past map and how their data and our data can come together. I'm now going to hand over to Peter to talk a bit more about some of the issues. OK, um, so the past map, uh, past map's been live since 2003. It's been rebuilt, refreshed recently. Um, can use live services like web feature services to share information. At the moment, it's a mixture of live services and downloads of data as shapefiles. But we, 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 want to, we want to move to a live service so that live information is feeding into the past map so that the public are accessing uh, the most up-to-date information. And these web services, web feature services, can also be streamed and taken into remote GIS so people can work with the data in their own systems. To do that, we need standards, and particularly for spatial information, we need to work with industry standards, not our own standards. And there's a thing called the INSPIRE Directive, which is looking at spatial information for the European community. Uh, it's supposed to be about environmental information. Cultural heritage doesn't feature that prominently. And it, so we, we actually need to think as a sector and work out how we should be delivering our information. For instance, statutory information, uh, scheduled monuments, listed buildings, is clearly within the INSPIRE Directive, but the status of the HER data it's not quite sure, and they, they're sort of trying to shoehorn it into a buildings theme, which isn't quite appropriate. So we need to actually say, we've got information that is different from the other more mainstream data sets, and this is just a roadmap of the implementation. So we've got until 2020 to get our um, act together. Um, and I say, we create polygons. The, the polygon, oh, it is very washed out. <laughs> um, we, we map information uh, for designation, schedule monument extent, trigger maps, this is the potential for use in planning inquiries or using uh, inventory information to say this is the actual site of the, the extent of the known information that we've got in our database or the activities that inform the records, like the excavations, the field surveys. But we also have the private sector also creating an awful lot of information through remote sensing, field survey, excavation. And that's without even thinking about new technologies, 3D laser scanning, uh, LIDAR service. All this information needs to be standardized so that we can understand it in the future. It may not be a particular problem now, but in 10 or 15 years' time, we're just going to have a jumble of information that doesn't really talk to each other and certainly won't be usable on a national or international scale. Um, just turn out to, we've been actually collaborating, collaborating online for 10 years, seven years in Scotland through OASIS, which manages the information flow from the um, from fieldwork care uh, initiated under the development control process, where the contractor enters the information directly into a form, which is then, it's actually imposing quite a lot of standards through controlled vocabularies and picked lists. And that's then fed through to the local authority curators, to the national records, and on to the ADS, uh, Great Literature Library. So it's been running since uh, 2004 in England, uh, 2007 in Scotland. There are now over 40,000 records in this system, which 24, just over half of these, 60% have been signed off, and there's 17, 18,000 uh, reports available through the Grey Literature Library. If it wasn't for OASIS, we probably wouldn't be able to access even a quarter of those reports. It'd be, it's just managing and controlling the information flow. But OASIS also does so much more. The information fed into OASIS uh, is taken by the ADS. They create web services to populate the Geophysical Survey Database in England. It helps provide metadata for their online archiving. And in Scotland, it provides project metadata for the radiocarbon database and for the Archaeology Scotland's de uh, current development of creating an online 
formed to record discovery and excavation of Scotland information. And then there's also OAI Harvester, which feeds metadata to the Marine Environment Data Information Network portal. So we're working with the marine sector to make our information offshore available to that community. And then information comes into the Commission. We aggregate that into our national record. We create spatial data sets, which we serve out through uh, web, feature, web map services. We create metadata records, which go into the Scottish Spatial Data Infrastructure Metadata Catalog, snappy title, which is then harvested to data.gov, copied to Medan, and we also then have a record on the INSPIRE registry as well. So we're making our information discoverable, and this is all standards driven. Uh, we've also got a track record uh, of working with the voluntary sector in Scotland. So Scotland's Rural Past, a five-year project, um, worked with over 60 community groups to allow the community groups to record information on an online form which could feed into our Canmore database. It also produced guidance, and uh, there's a link on the slide to a practical guide for recording of archaeological sites. It's not everything that's necessarily online. It's actually about how you actually do the fieldwork. So it's getting the communities to engage with, their, with, with, their, with the heritage in their area. Through My Canmore, we're, allow we're allowing um, the public to upload images to help populate our record. And it's not necessary, thanks Martin, um, it's not necessarily the sites that we think they'd be populating. This is a photograph of a block of flats, which is yeah, probably not of great interest to, to a lot of people, but somebody's placed value on that. So it's their heritage, it's them taking interest in what they do. And we're also collaborating with the, the Welsh Royal Commission and English Heritage through Britain from above to make uh, the Aero Films collection of aerial photography uh, from 1919 to 1953 available online. And that uses citizen science to help identify unlocated images and to, for them to, for the public to add memories and information about those photographs. So we want to make information more accessible. The um, UK government's recently signed up to the G8 Charter for Open Data. We also have a series of UK government po public data principles. Um, uh, I'll not go through these all now, but uh, it's say, stating that public data should be published in reusable, machine-readable form and should be released under the same open license, which enables free reuse, including commercial reuse, which is an interesting uh, development. And it's saying public data will be freely available to use in any lawful way. And we should encourage reuse. It's all about making information discoverable, usable, and understandable. So how do we measure up uh, this, the Tim Berners-Lee five-star open data? We've got a lot, lot of work to do. We're just, we're just about getting there with the key vocabulary is five-star, but everything else is still under licensed data or basically on the internet, but the licensing is not particularly clear. Uh, so there's a big, uh, it's an exponential growth and availability of data in both structured and unstructured forms, but we still keep data in silos. That's the silos of the organization. There's also our attitudes to how we should share information. So we need to address the issues of data hugging, saying our data is wrong, we can't publish it. Use citizen science to allow people to help refine our data. So it's just about turning the arguments around. And if we do that, we can then benefit from making our information available. In this, ugh. <laughs> um, the, the Lewis chess was a chess set discovered in uh, Lewis in 1831. We've got a record in our database about the find spot. The National Museum of Scotland has got much of the collection. It's got an online page describing that, the find spot and the art of, some of the artefacts. And the British Museum has got an online catalogue of the artefacts they hold. They've also published that information as linked to open data, which is saying, here's the data, go and use it. So we should be able to be able to take the information from these three sources and mash it up and create something new that provides a totality of the record. Um, Another example where we could benefit from closer collaboration, the British and Ar Irish Archaeological Bibliography records bibliographic references for the archaeological literature in the historic environment. There are over 200,000 references, 1,500 records added each year, and it complements and enhances the information we have in our record systems, but we don't talk to each other. And um, Martin uh, posed a question in the HER forum back in 2008, asking about you know, were people... Uh, keeping up to date with the national journals where they're trawling through that for information. And the responses were, no, we don't routinely do this. We've been considering it's part of the backlog and it's a medium priority. And of course, the volume of information is increasing, so it's still getting pushed down further and further down. So 
by using linked data approaches, we may be able to, we should be able to take the information from the site records and the bibliographies and link them together to create something better that helps improve our records. So just to, to conclude, Kirsty's described the high level strategy about uh, recognizing the need to collaborate and sharing of information. We've already got success stories and collaboration through OASIS, through past map, and we engage the communities. We're bringing in new, 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 new audiences to use and actively work with our information. And we can harness that information to help improve and refine our, record, our records. And then there's the drivers to extend uh, collaboration and, and standards so that people outside our sector can understand how we use and how we create information through Inspire for spatial information and the open data to make the information available. That way we'll end up creating much more accessible and informed in the historic environment data. Thank you.